Hi, welcome back to the video in this channel. I'm Varun and today's topic is Thermal Properties of Water. Seems to be a very boring topic, but it really isn't. Um, don't think of this as a lecture, but rather a story where we just learn things as they come. Um, then, so I'll get into topics of what you're going to be doing in Thermal Properties of Water. There are several Thermal Properties of Water. I'm going to be covering just three. One is latent heat of fusion and vaporization. Two is evaporation, very misunderstood topics. And finally, three is anomalous behavior of water. Seems to be very hi-fi, but it really isn't. Anomalous just means weird. So third is just weird behavior of water. One, latent heat. I thought latent heat was that amount of energy that needed to be supplied to a substance just to just change the state of the substance. So normally you're, you're supplying heat and the vibration of the molecules is increasing. But then when you're changing states, the vibration of the, and the molecules remains constant and you need to supply some little amount of energy to break those bonds so that now the vibrating particles are now free. They're like freer, let's say, than they, they previously were. So if you, if you had a solid, then it would, the, at zero degrees Celsius for ice, the vibration of the molecules would be constant and you have to supply the latent heat of fusion to break those bonds and now those particles are freer and are in the liquid state. So that's latent heat of fusion. But what I thought was latent heat and latent heat of fusion and vaporization is very small quantities. Like if it takes one, it takes one calorie to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius, just from like 50 to 51 degrees Celsius, let's say. But it takes, I thought it takes like 0 0.1 calories to change one gram of ice to one gram of water. I was wrong. I'll tell you I was wrong. And this is what most people think. They, they, because no one gives you values, you automatically think okay, latent heat of fusion, latent heat of vaporization, both are going to be very small quantities. But they're not small, they're not small quantities. In fact, latent heat of fusion is 80 calories per gram. So what I'm saying is, if you have one gram of ice at zero degrees Celsius, you have to supply 80 calories to melt that into water at a constant temperature. And in comparison, it, takes, it just takes one calorie to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And latent heat of vaporization is even bigger. It's, it's huge. It's 540 calories per gram of liquid to convert into water vapor. So it's, it's a huge quantity. In terms of time, if it took you one minute to heat a certain amount of liquid water to, from freezing to boiling, if it took you one minute, it would take you five and a half minutes just to boil that water from 100 degrees Celsius itself. Now let's talk about evaporation. To understand evaporation thoroughly, we need to understand how liquids operate at a fundamental molecular level. Liquids are not gases, nor are they solids. In solids, the molecules are bound and they can oscillate about fixed positions. In gases, there is little to no attraction between the molecules. They can go in random directions. But in liquids, the liquid molecules can only move within the liquid and cannot escape the liquid. If they could not move within the liquid, then they're fixed in their positions and they would be a solid. If they can escape the liquid, they, could, they would occupy the entire volume of the container and would be gases. So evaporation, let's get to exactly what the phenomenon of evaporation is. Now to understand evaporation, there's some, one thing you have to understand, heating. Heating is intimately related with evaporation because evaporation can't take place without heat exchange with the surroundings. So the main uh, motive here is to differentiate heat uh, evaporation and boiling and to clear the doubt of a, a specific temperature for evaporation. So some people think that at 20 degrees Celsius evaporation starts or some other number. It's not like that and I'll explain exactly why. So first let's get into heating. So if you're considering boiling, then the heating process is very standard. You give enough heat to make sure that the bulk of the water re uh, reaches 100 degrees Celsius and then you give even more heat to give latent energy to all the molecules, break all the bonds, it turns into gas, nice and easy. Now in evaporation is a bit different. Uh, in evaporation, your water turns into water vapor before the bulk reaches 100 degrees Celsius. So example, you're, you have one liter of water and you're heating it. So you're heating it from zero degrees Celsius and you just check it at some point in time and it says that the bulk is 80 degrees Celsius. You put a thermometer in and it says 80 degrees Celsius. Now you measure the volume and it's saying 950 ml. So where did that 50 ml go? The bulk has not even reached 100 degrees Celsius yet and 50 ml is already gone. Now how can 
50 ml just go without reaching 100 researchers? That's the question of evaporation. Let's clarify one doubt. This 50 ml has not come from a specifically defined region of the liquid. So if you have a pot, say, and you're evaporating the water, it's not like 50 ml came from this particular region. No, it came from all over the liquid. Second is, why did this 50 ml get enough energy to break while the others did not? So the first thing you have to understand here is that water is not some, like liquids aren't some super uniform thing where each molecule has same vibration and they're moving in the same direction, everything is same. No, it's it's not that. It's completely, it's very complicated in, in the microscopic level, molecules are going all over the place. It's like Brownian motion, everything is going everywhere. So basically there's irregularity in energy distribution in water. And in the on the macroscopic scale, you can say, okay, each one centimeter cube has enough, has equal energy. But actually, microscopic level, different molecules have different energies and through collisions, energy is, you know, transferred. And so that the temperature is overall constant. Now, the problem is that sometimes these certain, certain few molecules, they are favored in the energy distribution. So through collisions, collisions are the way energy is, trans is transported between different molecules. Through collisions, a certain small amount of molecules have stolen, effectively stolen energy from the rest of the bulk and have reached 100 degree surges. So certain molecules uh, through collisions, random collisions, certain uh, molecules got enough energy, got lots of energy vibration by stealing from other, other molecules and have reached 100 degree surges. So they have reached that amount of vibration. Now they steal some more energy and they steal latent heat also because it's only a few molecules, latent heat will be pretty small for that molecule. So they steal more energy, some molecules, okay? So they steal some energy and they happen to be near the surface, okay? They've stolen energy, they happen to be near the surface. Now their energy will be displayed in the form of kinetic energy. So they're moving much faster than other molecules. Now if they happen, if the trajectory happens to be near the, like going straight up or a bit to the angle to the surface, then they are able to actually escape the liquid. So basically, in summary, certain molecules, few molecules, not a lot of molecules, very few, like I talk about 50 ml here, it's actually much smaller than 50 ml. So few, certain few molecules, they steal energy from the rest through random collisions. And they're able to, if they are pro possibly, they're able to break through the surface if their trajectory is suitable. There are a lot of molecules which are near the bottom of the container. They, are, they get enough energy, but they aren't able to make it to the surface in time. Then they will simply lose energy through collisions as well. So collisions are way energy is transferred. So if by chance some collisions gave you energy, those collisions can also take away energy from you. So if you're near the surface, then there is less chance of collisions taking away energy from you. As soon as you get enough energy, you can escape. So now it's very difficult to define a particular temperature for evaporation simply because of the fact that it's random collisions that's giving these certain few molecules their energy. So at 80 degrees Celsius, say, at 80 degrees Celsius, each molecule needs just 20 more, 20 degrees Celsius energy and some latent energy and they'll escape. So that's 20 degrees Celsius. They can still evaporate. If they, if through collisions they get enough energy, they can go. At 10 degrees Celsius, also the same can happen. At 10 degrees Celsius, through random collisions, just has to be more violent collisions. At 10 degrees Celsius, also, if that happens, then a certain few molecules can escape. There are three basic factors that affect evaporation that I'm going to be talking about here. One is simply temperature. At, at higher temperatures, rates of evaporation is more. At 10 degrees Celsius, the rate of evaporation can be less than the rate of evaporation at 80 degrees Celsius. Why? Because at 80 degrees Celsius, it's much more easier for molecules to gain that 20 degrees Celsius of energy and latent energy to break than it takes for a water, water molecule to gain 90 degrees Celsius of energy and latent energy. So it's, it's more likely that molecules will be able to break out. Second is uh, humidity. So in humidity, what happens is there is more concentration of water molecules in the air. So what that means is your rate of outgoing water molecules is going to remain constant irrespective of humidity. But the problem is that if the concentration of water molecules in the air is more, there is more likelihood that a stray water gaseous molecule is going to end up actually in its random motion fall back into the water. So the rate of outgoing is constant, but rate of ingoing is going to be affected by the humidity. Higher humidity, more number of water molecules are actually going to come straight back into the water. 
Okay, third one is surface area. So remember the third thing, the trajectory has to be such that the water molecule is the water molecule is going straight out of the surface. Like that, if there is more surface, more likely that water molecules are able to actually get out. If it's like a very very deep surface, then water molecules, the bottom have no chance of actually going all the way up, up through all this liquid. But if there is if it's spread out, then water molecules just have to get like one centimeter distance covered that much, and then that's it, they're out. I came across a peculiar point on the discussion of heat energy and kinetic energy. Um, this is a story, so if you come across any peculiar points, I'll just state it out. There is no time constraint. Right. The peculiar point is related to heat energy and kinetic energy. So the point is heat energy is a much better storer of energy than kinetic energy is. What that means is particles can store energy in the form of heat much better than they can store energy in the form of kinetic energy. Let's take an example here. A human body sweats much more than one gram of water per day. How much energy does it really take to evaporate one gram of water? 540 calories, which is much more than 2000 joules. So let's just say it's 2000 joules. The human body can effortlessly give 2000 joules in the form of heat. You don't have to put effort in to evaporate water, right? Like you sweat automatically. There is no effort to put in. So we can effortlessly give out 2000 joules. Can we effortlessly give out 2000 joules in the form of kinetic energy? Simple answer is no, we can't do that. The thing is, uh, let's take an example. How would you give 2000 joules in the form of kinetic energy? That would probably mean you'd have to throw something at some velocity, then you gave energy in the form of kinetic. How much, what exactly would you have to throw to give 2000 joules? Well, you would have to throw a 10 kg dumbbell at 20 meters per second or 72 kilometers per hour to give 2000 joules. So point being, one gram of water vapor has more energy than a 10 kg dumbbell has while moving with 20 meters per second. So heat energy is this all dominant form of energy in the universe where it can be really concentrated and still have you know normal effects. Like one gram of water, water vapor isn't extremely hot bursting with energy, but a 10 kg dumbbell moving at 20 meters per second, you know, if it hits you, gone. Now coming to the third part of the video, that is the anomalous behavior of water. What does anomalous mean? I think I've mentioned this probably, it means weird. So the anomalous behavior of water means the weird behavior of water. What exactly is weird in water's behavior? Well, there are a lot of things, but relating to heat, uh, it's solid state. The solid state of water is less dense than the liquid state, or you can say ice floats on water. Now, normally in the general you know, character of substances is that in their solid state, they are more dense than in their liquid state or their solid form would sink in their liquid form. That is the general character for most substances that have a solid and liquid state. Now, why does this special property arise that is related to the anomalous behavior of water? Let me explain what exactly the anomalous behavior of water then this will become very clear. Now to understand why ice is less dense than water, we have to understand exactly how the molecular arrangement changes when water gets cooled down to ice. So first of all, why do we assume that solids will generally be denser than liquids? Well, the thing, problem is that on cooling, you know, if you're looking about molecules, molecules are moving all about the place in, in, the, in liquids. Moving, they're jostling each other, they're moving kinetic energy and stuff. In solids, they're just vibrating about the same fixed position. So what happens is as your internal relative motion reduces, then collisions reduce and hence the net gaps reduce. Let's say in liquids, there's a lot of kinetic energy, a lot of particles moving with respect to each other. What does that mean? One high energy particle moves and hits another energy particle and as it moves, it leaves it leaves a gap in its wake. And this gap is filled in by other molecules, but then as they fill in the molecule, they leave gaps. So overall, there is some net gap between the molecules that is created because one particle is moving with respect to another. So it moves, creates a gap, these particles move in, they also create a gap which is filled in by other molecules, but there is some net gap that is constant. Now the problem is, so this, if there are more gaps, then less dense. Now on cooling, generally, these particles will slow down and come closer together because you do inter intermolecular attractions. So the gaps will reduce. If, you're, if particles are moving with slower speeds, then they collide less or they collide with less velocity and hence they leave a smaller gap in their wake before collision. Hence this gap is, the net gap is going to be smaller and the density is going to be greater.
our assumption was that the most stable state will be the state where all the molecules are packed in in order to reduce their gaps. So if you had, you know, one layer of water molecules, the other layer would come so as just directly on top so as to reduce the gaps in between. That's not what happens. In reality, the water molecules or the substances molecules arrange themselves in order to be most stable. Now for normally, normally the most stable arrangement is the most, the least gap arrangement. The problem with water molecules is that they are polarized. They have these uh, specific directions in which they can bond in. So I'll explain that later. First, let's come into the molecular arrangement of water on cooling. So water is a very normal, normal, you know, substance up to a certain point. So on cooling water, its density will generally increase up to a point, which is known as, which is, uh, which is four degrees Celsius. So if you have 80 degrees Celsius water and you're cooling it, there's going to be lots of collisions, lots of high speed, lots of net gap. And I'm cooling it down, the velocity decreases, density will increase generally on cooling down. Now it's going to increase, increase, increase up to a point called, which is the four degree Celsius point. So its maximum density is going to come at four degree Celsius. So if you were to drop, if you were to plot density and temperature, your cooling density would increase, increase to four degree Celsius. It's not exactly a straight line, but let's assume it's a straight line for now. Now at four degree Celsius, it has maximum density. Why does it now, if I'm saying it's four degree Celsius maximum density, then on the cooling further, the density is going to decrease now. So you, I'm basically telling you one degree Celsius water is lighter than four degree Celsius water. So let's understand the exact mole molecular arrangement of the molecular structure of a single water molecule. So a single water molecule is, a, is actually a polar molecule. That means one side of the water molecule has a net negative charge and one side of the water molecule is a net positive charge. Now, this positive charge is not just one positive here, one negative here, nice linear arrangement. It's not exactly like that. There is some angle, there is some angle to this positive and negative charges. So there'll be a negative charge here, two hydrogen atoms here, each having a positive charge. So there's going to be basically each, each positive charge, each negative charge is a hand in itself. What is a hand? A hand is a way for bonding. So this hydrogen atom has this one hydrogen atom has a positive charge. It's going to attract another, another water molecules, oxygen atom, which has a negative charge. And these are going to align so that this hand and this hand meet and you got a bond. So these basically what I'm trying to tell you is these hands coming from each water molecule are at a specific angle. There is not going to be a nice linear arrangement where everything is just going to come in a line or in parallel lines. No, there is some specific angle to these things. And that's why on cooling, these bonds start forming. On cooling, say until four degrees Celsius, you're normally cooling the water molecule down. Kinetic energy is decreasing, but the kinetic energy is larger, is large enough such that if any bond forms, it breaks within 10 to the negative eight seconds. So two, two a bond forms, since each molecule has too much kinetic energy, it breaks very quickly. So there is no lasting bond formation until four degrees Celsius. Now, after four degrees Celsius, on cooling further, the molecules lose kinetic energy and hence they do not have enough kinetic energy to actually break a bond. So two hands meet, there is not enough kinetic energy for the hand to be, the, the bond to be broken. Hence this bond is lasting. It's actually significant. What happens is now you cool further, further, further. Now there's literally no single water molecule is breaking any bonds. Bonds are formed. Everyone is in their places. Every water molecule has each hand of every water molecule is occupied with another hand of another water molecule. And what you get is this 3D crystalline lattice where each molecule has bonds with other water molecules and these bonds are lasting. Now, the problem here is that this structure has gaps. There are certain gaps. So basically on cooling down, the water molecules are telling each other, okay, you stand here, you stand here and that way everyone's happy. Now, this is why ice is less dense than water, because in ice, there are these huge gaps in between the, the huge gaps in the structures. Now, how, how much exactly ice is less dense than water? Well, very less. Ice is not super dense, super less dense than water. It's very less. That is why you hear these icebergs floating on water. They barely float. Like very less amount of the ice actually protrudes out of the water surface. Most is underneath water. So the ratio of the volumes that gives the ratio of the densities of ice and water. Since most of the iceberg 
is actually under the water and we can basically say the ice and water density is almost the same ice is just a little bit less dense than water that is why only a little bit of the iceberg floats on the top okay now let's talk about the consequences of the anomalous behavior of water it has like huge consequences mainly you know revolving around the point that ice is less dense than water and ice turns out to be very white in color so because ice is less dense than water icebergs ice shelves ice shelves they all float on the water surface what that means is they're going to accumulate on the top of the water surface now normally if sunlight strikes water it's absorbed by the water and the water heats up and if you're talking about on the global scale there's a lot of ocean in the world right so if sunlight strikes it's going to be absorbed by, by the water and hence the water is going to absorb the heat and increase the global temperature now if uh, that certain piece of water certain amount of water was covered with ice say that region became too cold then ice started floating to the top now the ice floated to the top say we're talking about antarctica region or the arctic region then waters the water will freeze over there ice will float to the top and form this covering of white now this because this covering is white any light that strikes this ice surface gets reflected and hence it cools global temperatures so to understand this point properly assume that okay let's say water uh, the density of water was less than the density of ice as normally with other substances as normally observed with other substances then ice would sink to the top the arctic would not be full of ice the antarctic would still be full of ice because ice actually is sitting on some land mass there the arctic would not be full of ice icebergs would sink to the bottom and the, the total white covering of the earth would reduce drastically and increasing the temperature by several degrees celsius and that would seriously impact all life on earth it would be unrecognizable so the average temperature or average temperature of the earth would increase by several degrees and hence life on earth would have to adapt differently and there would be completely different life on earth another interesting phenomenon related to uh, this anomalous behavior of water an application of this is favorable for aquatic animals so it's usually applied in lakes it's we can observe this phenomenon in lakes what happens is as if this lake is located in a very cold region then there's going to be aquatic animals living over there if it's located in a very cold region then if the temperatures go sub zero the, the ice will, the ice will start to form the water will start to freeze now this ice starts floating to the top now interesting property of ice is that it's a very good insulator or heat passes very slowly through ice so the ice so formed will float to the top and will form a sort of layer on the lake and this layer of the lake is an insulator so it's a pretty good insulator it will prevent heat from going in or out so what happens is the water below some ice was formed the ice formed and formed thin sheet on the top water below is preserved the water below stays at some more than 0 degree temp 0 degrees celsius temperature so aquatic animals can still move around in water so the entire thing was prevented from freezing because it's sort of like this uh, ice is formed and forms a protective protective sheet and prevents the remaining water below from getting frozen because ice is a good insulator so the temperatures above the ice like the air can be negative but inside can be positive because ice is a very good insulator so this ice being a very good insulator means that the ice can protect the remaining water for at easily four months and hence since winter lasts only four months aquatic animals can still live in a lake so that's it for the video. I apologize if I spoke for too long, unnecessarily stressing on points that did not need to be stressed upon. I apologize for that. I'll try to work on that from, for future videos so that I can keep things concise. Thank you. Goodbye.